Hi everyone, my name is Daryl Payne, CEO of As Good As Gold Australia, and today once again I'm joined by my brother Brian and partner Thank at you. As Good As Gold. Thank you, Daryl. Uh, and today we interview David Morgan from the Morgan Report and recently appointed advisor to As Good As Gold Australia. Good morning, David. Good morning, David. Well, it's good afternoon for me, but good morning to you both. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On opposite sides of the world. Um, David, tense times around the world, I believe. And I also believe that, uh, Oleg, I need, to show, I need to show everybody this because I think they're going to have to become, they're going to become more and more accustomed to seeing this. Look, that's the Aussie dollar and the American dollar. Once very powerful currencies, I think they're going to be, have to get used to seeing a lot more of this stuff. So it's this turning into this. I, I can't see any way out of this, but significant levels of inflation. And I think the everything bubble in Australia, David, is about to burst, and I don't think for a second that it's only going to happen here. Josh, uh, Treasurer Josh Frydenberg's comments a couple of days ago here in Australia. Can't believe this. But he said, we are experiencing the strongest economic growth in Australia in more than half a century. Can you believe that? Mm. These were these are quoted words. We are experiencing the strongest economic growth in Australia for more than half a century. That comes from our esteemed treasurer. What he didn't say was this, uh, that, that that may be, but due solely to hundreds of billions of dollars of government spending to support a failing economy. Now, in that same period of the lost production in Victoria, and it's under two weeks again, two weeks shut down now, about halfway through it. In that same period, lost production in Victoria, Victorian economy due to lockdowns and consequently business closures cost the state $143 million a day. Former Victorian Premier Jeff Kennett was interviewed the other day, just a couple of days ago, and he confirmed that many businesses were going down for the final count with this current lockdown in, our, in a two-week period. He said they simply will not survive. Now, that's pretty serious, but it gets a lot worse because during the March quarter, Keep in mind, we had zero wage growth during this period, as has been the case for the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, everybody's been talking about it. Everybody wants to be paid more. So zero wage growth, but property values in Victoria during this absolute chaos increased by 1% over that quarter. And they have been in sorry, 1%, 1.8% in the last month, in the last month. And they have been increasing at a similar rate over the last six months. So let me, did, let me just clarify here. I mean, this has got to be a recipe for a disaster. So zero wage growth, massive stimulus spending, debt level soaring, businesses closing down at unprecedented numbers, and property values escalating at record rates. David, I'm going to ask the question, how long before the bubble bursts? This is the question. It's not the <laughs> dollar or the billion dollar question. At this point in time, it's the trillion dollar question. <laughs> Obviously, I don't know. I, I believe we're getting uh, much, much closer. Let me, dare I answer it in this way. Uh, I've been doing more interviews than ever. And uh, Stanley Drunkenmiller did an interview recently, I think, with one of the top, uh, you know, news medias. <clears throat> and he made the statement that he didn't see the U.S. dollar being a reserve currency within the next 15 years. And that uh, meme was taken up by a couple of the interviews that I did subsequent to his. And I said, I don't see it going five. I mean, what you just outlined, Daryl, is 
not only a, a prescription guaranteed for disaster, <clears throat> it's, uh, is it imminent? I won't use that word, but it's closer than 15 years. I can almost guarantee that. So what the deal too is, of course, what's called systemic risk. I mean, all these banks are interconnected. They all use the U.S. dollar as the reserve currency. There's a massive amount of reserves that are held in uh, treasury bills, notes, and bonds. And once one domino falls, then it's going to hit two dominoes, four, eight, 16, and on, because, again, they're all interconnected. And, of course, this is what has taken place a few times, and we have been able to, we, the financial system, has been able to persevere and, and press on with a lot of stimulus. I mean, Barings Bank, I remember when Barings Bank went down, I thought that's it. That's going to take the whole thing down. I think that bank was found in like the 1600s or 1700s or something. Nope. Pressed on, moved on, non-event, nothing to see here. And then when long-term capital management went down, I was pretty sure that was going to be it. And it could have been, but Greenspan reacted uh I don't even know if appropriately is the correct word, appropriately for the banking system he acted. Mm -hmm. And it uh, prevented as that one domino was falling toward the two that were going to the four, the eight, the 16. Uh, he caught that first one and pushed it the other direction and kept the systemic issue from taking place because it would have. All the major money center banks that were locked into this 20% guaranteed return from long-term capital management, having the algorithm of all algorithms that could predict human behavior. And you can, you can predict human behavior some of the time, but not all the time. And that of course mm -hmm. was proven by that. So I won't draw on any further. I think you outlined it perfectly, Daryl. I am very concerned and, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll put my neck out. I've certainly put my neck out many times during, you know, my career. I don't think we have three years. I would be surprised if 2022 starts the, um, I guess, the mindset of, oh, my goodness, we're here. What do I do about it? And when that mindset hits, people are going to look for safety and they're going to look for something they trust. There's nothing more trusted in the history of mankind on a monetary basis than gold and silver. They've got thousands of years of trust by the populace. It's just we're so undereducated. And as Brian pointed out before we started the recording, it's the cognitive map. It's how you think. If you can control people's thinking about money, then you have a huge advantage because very few people you know, think outside the box or think for themselves or critically think and actually question, first of all, what is money? Do we even use it anymore? And what is its purpose? And how is it, you know, how does it come about? And all these questions that are pretty basic, but most people don't ever bother to ask. But believe me, the old adage, once the ship has sunk, everyone knows how it might have been saved, will become the mantra for the globe because there'll be two sets of people on the planet. There'll be the people that had precious metals that were saved, and then there'll be everybody else. But that lesson will be learned again, I believe. The problem is it takes such a long time. I mean, there's a, it's a long time between drinks. I mean, it takes approximately 100 years to destroy an economy. Uh, and when we, we go back to 1913 at the establishment of the Federal Reserve, we're just over 100 years now, and they've been devaluing currency for as long as they've been in existence, and in particular since 1971, of course, when they took America off the gold standard. But it takes a long time, and people have very short memories. And so they get caught out every time. Inflation is an insidious uh, creature. Uh, you just don't, because it's so slow, the process, you don't notice it eating away at your standard of living until... Um, it, it comes crumbling down. And I very, very often share this line of thought. It's like a juggler who may be comfortable with seven balls in the air, but then you throw that juggler at the eighth and they start to struggle a little bit. And then nine, they're almost 
out of control and then the tenth ball is just too much and they just lose control of everything. And I think that's what happens when you manipulate markets to the extent that governments and central banks do all around the world. They reach a point where you just can't continue. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but uh, my next question really follows on from Darrow. I mean, Darrow spoke about the debt here in Australia. Um, I'm going to refer that to the debt around the world, but specifically the United States, because at the end of the day, the United States dollar is supposed to be the confidence dollar of the world, the reserve currency of the of the world, backing the Australian dollar, and we're spending it like drunken sailors. Um, so, David... I listened to a, uh, a representative stockbroking firm, Raymond James, out of Canada, and he uh, commented that the government of the United States pays out 70% of its revenue to entitlements and debt interest. David, if interest rates, which are in, in, in America is between zero and half or a quarter of 1%, if interest rates double, so let's say 1%, Will that force the United States to change direction? My take is no, it wouldn't. I mean, we're already behind the power curve. There's nothing that can, behind the power curve, I'll explain. It's an aircraft term. It's a real thing. And what it means is you, the airplane is stalled out, but you've got plenty of power left for, you know, if you're in a jet thrust or if you're in a prop airplane, you've got more power. And behind the power curve means that once you've stalled out and you've got all this power, you can firewall it, which means give it everything you got, all the power that's left, and you're still going to stall because you're behind the power curve. What that means is no matter how much power you've got, you're going to the ground, baby. There's nothing you can do about it. It applies to a jet, applies to a prop airplane. So that's an analogy for what I'm saying. We are so far in debt that by changing the interest rate, doubling the interest rate on the national debt, would it, ca it, pro it cause you to, to stall faster or fall faster, perhaps, as an analogy? But we're going down no matter what. If we just, right, what's been happening, as you both know, is what's called financial repression. The government's been in charge of the interest rates for a very long time. Now, the free market's supposed to determine the interest rates, but really, the Fed's basically had control. And because of that, they keep it low and they keep it low so that you can manage the national debt. Because, again, to repeat, the interest rates goes too high. You know, it's like a credit card. You want a 5% annual rate on your credit card or you want an 18%? Well, you might be able to afford the payments at a 5% interest rate and barely make that minimum credit card payment every month. But if it goes to 18%, it's the same debt, but you can't afford the minimum payment because it's increased substantially. Same thing here. So yeah, it would have an effect, but regardless, I think the main point I'll stress is that we're behind the power curve. Mm. Yeah, look, uh, the I don't go to this website all the time, but if you have a look at the US uh, debt clock uh, and you just see the, the dollars rising, um, I know when, uh, uh, when there was a change of presidency at the beginning of the year, it was just under 28 uh, billion, a trillion. Uh, now it's uh, 28.3. So it just keeps on rising. It doesn't matter how good the economy gets from what I, from what I can see. And I'm not an economist, but I, I've been in business for long, long, a long time. And it doesn't matter how good people talk about the economy, the debt just keeps on going. And I don't see a good way out of that one. Um, enough about debt for the moment, uh, David. Um, I, because I have a number of gold mining shares, this term comes up, and I just want your viewpoint. Very quick question. The term sell in May and go away is a common term as a trader. Do you believe that that may not be appropriate in 2021? I actually had that exact question from one of uh, the Morgan Report members, and I answered that <clears throat> I think it does not apply this year. A uh, good year to look back on recent, it was 2016. Uh, we had a massive rally through the summer months of 2016. In fact, I was in error. Uh, I thought after the year 2016, it so accelerated so much and so much momentum and so much uh, increase in volume 
Then I thought we'd finally achieve the bottom in the precious metals. And I looked for a pullback in 2017, which we got, but it kept going down. So the 2016 was a great year. We traded a particular stock and made, I think, six times on our money. But regardless, <clears throat> that wasn't the bottom. I was wrong. But coming back, I think, you know, you, what you pointed out is very accurate. I refer to the real estate bubble um, just earlier. The, it seems as though we are in a, it's an everything bubble at the moment. The world is placed in exactly that position. How about the stock market? Uh, Pierre Lasson, I just recently uh, heard him commenting on a a one-to-one ratio, gold to Dow ratio. It's happened a couple of times already, 1924, uh, 1929 to 34. Um, Again, in 1980, where, the, where gold hit $800 an ounce and the Dow sat at 800. He believes that over the next three to five years, we're going to see it again, one-to-one. And he believes those numbers are going to look something like this. The Dow at 25,000, that's down considerably from where it is now at about 34 and a half. And gold at twenty $25,000 an ounce. What are your thoughts? I, you know, first of all, <laughs> I'd be a little bit foolish to argue with Pierre Lassonde, but uh, <laughs> I'm actually a bit surprised um, that he made that comment. He's pretty conservative, as am I. Yes, I think that's, I wouldn't say it's inevitable. I think that's probably a good way to, first of all, it's a very accurate way to think about it. It's really good to think in ratios because if you think in dollar terms or price only in a highly inflationary environment, the price at some point can become meaningless. Uh, I'm not saying hyperinflation, but as I said, highly inflationary environment. So, you know, what does $25,000 buy you uh, if you know you're destroying the currency, you're in a true currency crisis, and people don't know week to week what the price levels are going to be. So that's point number one. But if you look at it from a value perspective, well, that ounce of gold buys the entire Dow Jones Industrial Average. Now you have a value proposition. You know what the value of that ounce of gold is, or you could different different ratio. Well, does that ounce of gold buy you in oil or bushels of wheat? or men's clothes, or automobiles, or houses, or whatever. So that's the way you really need to think about it, especially as this accelerates. But no, I think it's quite likely. Uh, it sounds preposterous, you know. I, I, don't, <laughs> I feel a bit odd confirming it, but I'll confirm the ratio. The prices will be what they'll be. And I think that, you know, his guesses are as good as mine. Who knows? It could be 5,000, 5,000. It could be 25,000, 25,000. It could be 100,000, 100,000. The point is that the ratio is one to one. And mm. with the amount of unbelievable misallocation of capital and, you know, as you both pointed out, you know, decreased jobs, increased housing at about percent a month, Non-stop spending and a stock market that's out of control. Almost every financial market on the planet be one vast speculative casino. I mean, what do you how do you expect this thing to end? And I just you know fret over it because there was a chance I would say back in two thousand and eight to put us on a track of. Recovery, and it would have been the overused expression tightening our belts, and it probably would have been really tight. But we could have admitted what we had done and where we went wrong and taken steps to mitigate the problem. But now it's out of control. And I think the only way out is to let Mother Nature, the Mother Nature of the uh-huh. economic systems, take over. And Daryl, you mentioned it takes, you know, like a hundred years to see uh, insidious inflation meet its, its demise. And you're correct, um, most democracies only last 200 years, and that's sort of where we are in the United States, although we're really not a democracy, we're a constitutional republic. But regardless, I think you get my point. And the last point I want to make is, 
the kind of destruction on a global basis where it affects almost everybody on the planet, that only happens about every 350 to 400 years. And that's the kind of reset I think we're going to see. I mean, I think it's going to be more than the next Bretton Woods. I think it's going to be so catastrophic that um, Bretton Woods is going to look like uh, eighth grade class compared to the, the doctorate that's going to be required to set this thing straight. Now, Having said that, I do think that uh, the central bankers, the banking elite, will try things like the central bank digital currencies that may not work. Just because that's what they want or that's what they plan doesn't necessarily mean that it will work. So you're saying this economic collapse, in your opinion, is going to be worse than the Great Depression, 1929? Yeah. Yeah. I put out in the April newsletter um, the, the quote from Elliot Janeway, who was a maverick of an economist. He wasn't a mainstreamer and didn't belong to anybody, so he could speak his mind. He said, the next Great Depression will make the last Great Depression, meaning the 30s, look like a small technical correction. So why is it that intelligent people, and there are lots of intelligent people, in the world. Why do they not research history? Because history clearly explains to them what you've just said. I think we've been through this before and I have to laugh because, you know, Santiana said the greatest lesson of history is people don't learn the lessons of history. And the answer is why. Mm. And that gets into intent. And I don't really know. I mean, you'd have to, you know, (laughs) put a microphone in front of everybody in the interview and why don't you study history? But, you know, generally speaking, it's boring. Who cares? It's the past. I live in the now. I'm, a, I'm an optimist. I'm looking to the future. What the heck does history have to do with where I'm going? And I think that kind of an attitude is pervasive. Most people have that kind of an attitude. Who cares what happened in the past? Look at all this technology. And this one thing I, you know, one of my, I'll say, pet peeves <clears throat> is technology will save us. Look, I've got the gadgets and the doodads. I was a very, very early adopter of the internet. Uh, one of the first to have a cell phone. I bypassed the uh, the great big shoebox sign, although actually my dad gave me one because we were in the cellular phone industry very early on, he and I. But um, he, he took it back. He said, you know what? I, I gave you the phone. I'm going to give, give it back. It's too much of a cost you know because in those days i forget it was like a buck 20 a minute or some ridiculous amount of money to call on that (laughs) darn thing but anyway yeah we're i'll give it back to you daryl and brian it's just very upsetting to me that we're past the point of no return i mean i'm convinced of that and i don't like seeing people get hurt and i really hate to see you know one of my favorite expressions the amount of uh line that goes on throughout the system, the amount of corruption throughout the system. And, you know, one of my favorite expressions is when you can lie about money, you can lie about anything. If you pretend money is a currency and it's not, and you can print it and make everybody wealthy, well, again, you're going to learn that lesson that it doesn't work. I think, David, if I could make a point, um, the way I see it is that we have too many people with short-term profit motivation. Um, they're not, you know, gold comes out of the ground with a growth rate of 1.6% and we're, governments tell us we need 3% growth in GDP and 4%, whatever. What's wrong with 1.5%? Technology will probably add 0.2% to that. So you got 1.8% growth every year. If you did that for 300 years, you'd be doing extremely well. You wouldn't have to worry about the, the rise and falls of Dow Jones and all this sort of thing. So that is my point of view, a bit of a rant, but you know, I'm going to ask the next question, David, and I think uh, you might have, uh, hopefully, and I'm sure you'll have a good answer for this. David, China and Russia have been increasing their physical gold position dramatically in the last 10 years. Do you believe that it may be getting close for them to use this to their advantage? But before you answer, let us remember that the United States prints infinite paper dollars to pay for natural resources, and these countries that provide the natural resources haven't got an infinite supply. There been rumours for years about a gold back you want, or, and... Uh, And another point that's really pertinent is that if you follow the Austrian school, which I adhere mostly to, 
the idea of capital formation isn't how many gold coins you can put together. It's the means of production. Capital is producing valuable items that the market wants. Food, obviously, but manufactured goods, automobiles, you name it. It's a means of production. So if you go back in fairly recent history, that subject that so few want to talk about, you'll find that uh, Great Britain was the productive capacity of the world. They did most of the most of the um, production was done via the UK. I wasn't saying everything's done in that island, but they had the means to produce stuff throughout their colonies and everything else. And, and they were the main producers and they had the most gold. Now, America took over as the main means of production and they had the biggest amount of gold. Now, China is the main means of production and we don't know exactly how much gold they have, but it's probably much more than they purportedly report. And so it's the old adage, follow the money. The producers have the gold. And when the main producer changes, they have the most gold. And when the main producer changes, they have the most gold. So back to the point, yeah, Russia and China have been building their gold reserves for decades, and they continue to do so. There was a paper put out recently by my friend Hugo Salinas Price, who's probably the number one advocate of silver in Mexico. He and I are friends, and we do correspond from time to time. And he wrote an article about uh, Putin wanting to go basically on a gold-backed ruble, and that the major international banking cartel basically pushed back on him and he, um, I'm, I'm just giving a paraphrase of it, basically backed off of the idea. And also in that article, he mentioned China as well. So it was implied that uh, Russia and or Russia and China were going to do a gold backed currency and they got a bunch of pushback and they basically backed off. That's the essence of how I read it. However, as we talked about earlier, I'm going to bring this over. So I'm going to read this, but this came on Kitco News today, and this is from uh, the national, excuse me, Russian National Wealth Fund, the NWF, will abandon all U.S. dollar assets and increase the holdings of gold, euros, the Chinese yuan, Russia's finance minister Anton Savanov stated, quote, like the central bank, we have decided to reduce investments in dollar assets. The sale of U.S. dollar assets will take place within a month. Furthermore, after the announced changes are implemented, the fund will hold 40% of its assets in euro, 30 in yuan, and 20% in gold. The Kremlin spokesman, Dmitry Peskov, also confirmed the decision later on Thursday, today, stating that Quote, the de-dollarization process is constant. It is, in fact, now visible to the naked eye. This would mean selling 40 billion in reserves for gold, yuan, and euro. So I think that's probably the biggest news item I've read about de-dollarization and what's going on in the gold market that I've seen in a very long time. Well, I'd have to agree upon that. I mean, you're, uh, I haven't picked up that particular news article, but it's um, out of Kitco and they do, they do have an, a, a large range of different uh, news articles. And the one with uh, um, the, the Mexican gentleman that you mentioned, Salinas Price, um, yeah, uh, I, I think he writes some darn good articles and, uh, and they are right, very, very factual, always have been very factual. Daryl? Look. David, what we've we've made reference to extreme volatility here. We what have we been talking about today? Massive debt levels, we're talking about volatility, loss of confidence in currency, um, and we know that this breakdown in the economy is closing in on us very quickly. What I with knowing all of that, David, could you? Please, this is probably not an easy question to answer, but, but none of them are. Um, could you explain to us what you believe the world is going to look like? What can we expect 
in the next 12 months, yeah. then five years from now, and the role that precious metals will play um, in the process? Yeah, that's a very difficult question because you know I dropped my crystal ball all the way over to my my seat here. It's okay. <clears throat> but all humor aside, um, first of all, what I'm about to say, I hope I'm wrong. Uh, I'm going to slant it toward the worst case. So I want people to know that. But I'm also trying to be as head and heartfelt as always, meaning that I'm not trying to BS anybody and I'm not trying to play the fear card. What I'm trying to do is give you the best of, you know, 40 years of study, all these books behind me, you know, the penniless billionaires and currency destructions, bankruptcy, 1999, money, we shall have honest weights and measures and on and on and on and on it goes. So first of all, precious metals will be very important in most locations for preservation of buying power but not everywhere. And the idea that money alone will save you is inaccurate. The way I see the next five years is going to be a steady contraction in the economy on a global basis. There will be some exceptions, but overall, there's going to be massive food problems from this point forward. Massive meaning that the production of food will not meet the the supply will not meet the demand. And the way, of course, supply and demand meet is by price. <clears throat> so you can expect increasing food prices across the board, regardless of temporary massive deflation or a bout of hyperinflation really doesn't matter for food. It's, go it's baked into the cake at this point, I'm convinced. The standard of living in the West is going to be extremely changed. The um, idea that everyone could afford everything and all you need is good credit is going to blow away with the wind. People are going to have a much lower uh, standard of living. And most people will be forced to live within their means, probably for many, for the first time, maybe since they were born. So you'll see a, and it's already been taking place for several years, Brian and Daryl, as you know, but there'll be an elimination of the middle class. The North, the North America will largely, not completely, but largely be a two-class society like you see in most of South America, where you've got the wealthy and everybody else. So there'll be vast areas where where once thriving suburbs will probably exist, but the makeup of them will be very, very different. Meaning that they'll be grandpa and grandma and the parents and the kids. So you have three generations under one roof. That will be fairly commonplace. And the job market will be increasingly difficult to get into for a well-paid job. A lot of what will go into robotics. You'll see a lot of the fast food restaurants go to kiosks where the, everything's done automatically. You might have one or two ambassadors there, real life people that will be there to answer your questions or whatever. But a lot of this stuff will be robotics. It will be, um, it'll displace people. Now there will be opportunities as well. I don't want to be all negative. <clears throat> that uh, people that want to stay ahead of the curve, so to speak, would want to get into, you know, that field, the robotics field. And of course, what's going on in technology that's always advancing at an extremely rapid pace. But overall, I think you'll see a lower lifestyle and people forced to live within their means, a two-class society, and precious metals will be key in most places to maintain your living standard or have a safe retirement or that type of thing. But again, there won't be the opportunities to buy um, the amount of goods that we have now. They just, they won't be available. They won't be manufactured. Too many entities will be going out of business because they cannot make a profit. And so you'll see kind of a natural order of things. I was asked this question on a, 
on a recent interview and I did it in about two minutes. I said, so what, you know, what's going to happen? I said, we got to b- bottom out first, you know, we'll hit bottom. When is that? Is that two years, five years, 10 years, 20 years? I would guess we'll bottom out actually fairly quickly. Um, and what does that mean? I don't know. I would guess maybe a decade, which, you know, is in a person's lifetime of 70 or 80 years, isn't really it hurts 10 years is 10 years, but it's not your entire life. And uh, once we hit that bottom, I think we're able to rebuild. But I hopefully, you know, we'll talk about build back better and all this stuff from the World Economic Forum and all what these uh, people at the Davos want for us. <clears throat> but that's not necessarily, again, what's going to take place. So the build back better hopefully will be with uh, some consciousness involved not some uh, idealism from a totalitarian type of state where we do, you know, have clean water for everyone. We do have organic food isn't even a term. We just grow food that's healthy. We don't even have to call it organic. Mm. We go back to the basics. And that's what nature preaches is balance. We're so far out of balance right now. We're going to be forced. And, you know, one of these lower cost diets. Now I know meat's extremely expensive and I am a carnivore, but um, when you get whole, you know, really the cheapest way you can live, at least in the North America is to buy bulk everything, right? Bulk peas, bulk grains, bulk, you know, oats. I mean, I won't name all the grains, but you get the idea. And that's really healthy. These are like natural foods, but you got to work to make them edible. You know, you got to soak the beans in water and all that stuff. And I don't want to go too far down a rabbit hole here. But the point is, sometimes a lower diet cost-wise is actually a healthier diet. All this pre-packaged nonsense with 27 preservatives you can't pronounce is not a healthy <laughs> diet. <I'm done. laughs> Look, I, I guess... Yeah, what you're saying. I mean, gold and silver aren't everything, but boy, oh boy, they're going to go a long way towards providing you with a better lifestyle than most. Let me interrupt you there, Daryl. I'm sorry, but, you know, no what I get criticized of often is, well, you can't eat gold, you can't eat silver. You can't, but you can't eat paper money either. <laughs> no. And the other point is, if you were in Venezuela and you had silver, you'd be a damn happy. You know why? Because if you're going to buy food, and it's expensive, and you have silver, chances are you're going to be able to buy it. Whereas if you got a bunch of, uh, you know, uh, pesos or whatever, you're not going to be able to buy it. So, you know, oh, you can't eat it. Yeah, but in most cases, when times are really tough, you can use it to purchase what you need. And that's one of the primary reasons we save in precious metals is because time and time again, that statement's been proven true. Are there exceptions to that? Yes, of course there are. But generally speaking, you've got real money. You can buy real goods just about anywhere. Yeah, yeah. Look, um, my, our mentor, Peter Daniel Sr., always used to say, save in precious metals, Daryl, Brian, save in precious metals. He would also say, I do not care what poorly executed economic decisions are made in the world tonight because tomorrow I'll still be able to party because he held gold, which held value. And it, it, what's interesting is that I have on our YouTube channel and we, on our interview sessions, I've told the story of gold versus real estate. I've told it two or three times, and yet I spoke with a couple of people on the weekend And they said, uh, because they had a couple of properties and they weren't making any money, they weren't getting a return from them. They bought some units 10 years ago and they really haven't appreciated in value at all. uh, They couldn't sell them today because they would lose money in the process. And I said, have have you ever heard of my reference to gold versus real estate? No. And yet they're good friends. Uh, there seemingly would be no reason why they hadn't heard this reference. But I shared it with them on the day. And uh, here's how it works. It's really important to understand this. But if somebody has a half a million dollars in gold, and some people say straight away, well, half a million, 
That's an enormous amount of money. Yes, it is. But lots of people have four and five and six and eight and 10 properties worth half a million dollars. So I'm just talking about a half a million once. So let's say you've got all of it in, in gold. Now gold's appreciated, Brian knows this. David, you know this, gold's appreciated over the last 20 years since 2000 at 2000 uh, at 20% uh, per annum. So 20% per annum. Now, let's say you've got that now. We're now entering a much more chaotic economic period in our lives than the last 20 years. So one would expect that gold could at or should at least produce the same result as it has in the last 20. So let's say it did that. Five years, so sorry, you've got half a million dollars. Over the next five years in preparation for your retirement, you allow that gold to appreciate 20% a year. What's it worth in five years time? One million dollars. So you could, in five years time, if gold continued to appreciate at that rate, liquidate at the rate of 20% per year, would have no detrimental impact on your account at all. You'd have less gold in your account, but it would be worth more. And so it would retain its value of a million dollars. So you could liquidate at 20% a year, $200,000 a year, and never impact on the balance of your account. Now you compare that to a property at a half a million dollars. And let's just say, for example, it appreciated at the rate of 20% per annum. So now it's worth a million dollars. A million dollar property in this state, in Adelaide, South Australia, will attract to the landlord around $30,000 a year. So real estate's providing you as an investment, 30,000 a year with additional costs. You've got council rates and you've got maintenance costs. You've got all sorts of costs associated with that $30,000 return. And with your gold, you're looking at $200,000 a year infinitum. I mean, no you, you've got to be kidding me. You've got to be kidding me. These people looked at me and said, why have we not ever seen you refer to that before? We must have, and it just didn't gel. They immediately placed an order for $100,000 worth of gold. You know, yeah, it's what? interesting. Again, going back to a recent interview, and well, it was a call-in show, talk show, and this guy is, oh, you're just a gold bug. And I pointed out the net compounding over the last 20 years, as you just did, Daryl, and I said, well, you know, you're looking at the last month's price, maybe the last few years' price, and you're convinced gold doesn't do anything. But, you know, when we got in at $250 an ounce and we're pushing toward $2,000 an ounce right now, yeah, yeah. you know, it has gone up. Yeah. And, and again, I, you know, I'm very almost uh, crazy about making the point that I've never told anybody to put everything in the gold. You know, but if you don't have something in the precious metals, you don't understand economics, you don't understand history, you don't understand the conditions we're living under, you don't understand what can happen in a massive contract, contraction in the economy that we just went through. And um, it's a life preserver from a financial perspective. And it can be even more than that in a true down and out barter type of situation. So it yeah. doesn't mean you have to put everything there. But again, you know, I'm not rooting for my house to burn down so I can collect on my fire insurance. You know, yep. I, but I haven't because if I don't, and my house burns down, I'm out a great deal. Now, I don't really like to use the insurance analogy too much, but it's appropriate, and especially for most people. Most people that are not as, um, you know, let's say, Overeducated in the uh, monetary history, such as yours truly, don't really care. All they want to know is that, you know, I've got a life insurance policy and I've got a financial 
life insurance policy. Therefore, I believe you, I have some precious metals to buy. And that's perfectly acceptable and sufficient. But I like that because, you know, the compounding on an average shows that gold has been in a bull market for quite some time. And if you go back to the start at 252 an ounce, I mean, 11 years in a row, gold was higher. Yep. 11 years in a row. And there aren't too many markets that can do that. There are some, you know, I know that. But, uh, you know, so we had this cooling off period and a lot of people gave up because, you know, the people that got in the last year or two and saw that a lower price for two years is like, okay, that's it. But that's not why you buy gold. You don't buy gold because it's got to go up from the day you buy it. You buy it like insurance. It's yeah. always there. And the one thing that I have the biggest problem communicating, and Daryl and Brian, you might be better at it, is how to think about precious metals. And the idea is, if that dollar represents is money and represents wealth, if I have more of those a year from now than I have now, I am by definition wealthier. But yes. that's not what people do. They say, oh, I paid 30 of these made up units that have a picture of somebody on them. And now the equivalent is 20 units. And oh my goodness, I've lost money. No, you have increased your money supply because <laughs> only metal is money. And you might have decreased the fiat phony paper paradigm equivalent in that given year, but who gives a rat's ass? If you do it correctly and you balance your portfolio and you keep cash where you need it, I don't pay my bills with this. Why would I? Correct. You know, I might make a deal with somebody because they want it and they know me or that type of thing. I'm off track, but you got, you know, you guys know all this, but it's hard to get people to comprehend that if you have a bigger pile of gold at the end of the year, you're actually wealthier because that is wealth or a, at least a, the best um, for thousands of years element that's exchangeable for any type of wealth, real estate, land, food, businesses, services, whatever. And so, you know, it's just arcane because you're taught by the powers that be that gold's a barbarous relic. There's only these gold bugs. Like this guy called me up. He didn't know anything about gold, but he was already very negative toward me because I'm a gold bug, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I think we've lost, David, I think we've lost direction in respect of what wealth is and what money is. And it always reminds me of one of the wealthiest and most pronounced uh, financiers in the United States. Uh, go back 100 years and the name of J.P. Morgan comes up. And the quote he uh, is often referred to is, gold is money, everything else is credit. And that is the most um, positive statement I've known on gold for a long time. And that's how I, that's how I look at it. Gold to me, gold and silver, is money. If I find a better business or a better way of using that money, I will, I will put some of that gold and silver that I own into that business or into that financial institution. But until I find something better that's doing better, I keep a lot of gold and silver because gold is money and I never forget it. And I, sorry, you know, I love the comment, but you know, I know a certain individual, I'll keep anonymous, that, you know, used to, was kind of a gold collector, but did the, uh, you know, the, the rare coin thing and had an opportunity and put, you know, cashed out and good for him because he made the good decision, but it was a wise decision. You know, this is just uh, a personal belief. It isn't a proof, but I have a belief that people that, that will trade their gold or silver for a business or a certain whatever, automobile, piece of land or whatever, are much more prudent and much more cognizant of what the transaction entails and whether or not it's really beneficial or not. Whereas if you're using credit and it's just that piece of plastic and you're only paying 18% on it and you, you, you owe it to yourself because you, you've had a bad day and you should buy something. <laughs> now, am I making sense here? It seems like if you're going to put yeah, real money absolutely. on the table, for a purchase, you're going to, have to really think that through. Well, what am I doing? Why am I doing it? Is it 
a good decision and that type of thing. Whereas if you just throw a piece of plastic out there, oh, well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like um, you, the other thing is, of course, with gold, you can't show off gold, right? You can show somebody an automobile. You can show somebody a jet ski. You can show somebody a Picasso. You can show somebody um, property. Have a look at my recent purchase, and you show them this wonderful home, and, and it, it makes you feel good. Come round to my new home, and let's have dinner together. But gold is is something that you don't show to anybody. In fact, you try and keep it as big a secret as you possibly can, or most people do, don't they? <laughs> so, so they can't get the thrill of, you know, bragging, I guess, about their, their assets. You know, Jared, many years ago, um, I'm talking three, four years ago, came up to me, uh, he said, what do you want to do this month, Dad? Uh, and I said, I'm just going to buy more gold, buy more silver. He said, why do you want to do that? You've got enough already. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, Jared, you just continue to add to your reserves. And now he never asked me anymore. And that's all we've ever done, isn't yeah. it? But we've done it for 30 years. And then people say, oh, look, I wished I'd done what you did uh, and started yeah. investing 30 <laughs> years ago. Well, you can start now <laughs> and do it for the next 30 years. That's really the point that we try, the message we try and get across, isn't it? Exactly. Because we will get through this as difficult as this next five, ten years will be. We will all get through it, but it will happen again. And you'd want to be prepared the next time around. Mm. And I know that my son will be, and I know that Brian's sons will be. The important thing is to get the message out to our viewing audience. Mm. Dave, uh, David, thank you so much for your input today. I, I would like to remind everybody of Charlie Jones, and I know that you know of Charlie Jones. Charlie, tremendous Jones, a United uh, American motivator. Um, and he always used to say this, in 10 years' time, you'll be in exactly the same position you're in right now, apart from two things, people you meet and the books you read. Well, today you're meeting David Morgan. And what I'd like David to do right now, if he could, is just share some feedback. Let us know, David, what would somebody do if they want to connect with David Morgan, if they want to take advantage of the Morgan Report, if they want to take advantage of your really educated, sound advice, where do they go? What do they do? Yeah, very simple. Just go to the main website, the morganreport.com and just get our free newsletter. I do a weekly update on the, I call it a weekly perspective because I usually take three, four, maybe five things in the financial press that I'll usually just show you because I make it a video. So it's verifiable, you know, Reuters, Bloomberg, whatever. And then I comment on it. And then at the end, I almost always comment on the precious metals. That's just one feature. A lot of interviews I do and uh, occasionally write or blog, <clears throat> that's all available for free. Uh, then, of course, if you're interested in the resource sector, primarily on the equity side, we do ETFs and uh, some asymmetric trades. <clears throat> that's listed in the pr uh, premium service, which is a paid service. And that's on the subscribe tab. If you're interested in the books, which is really the best bargain that we have on the website, just hit the books tab. Uh, the Silver Manifesto is still available. It still could go to Australia. I'm not shipping to Europe anymore. It's just too cumbersome. We pay all the customs fees and sign all their little lines and check all their little boxes, and they still ship them back to us. So I just, you know, gave, gave up uh, on Europe's, uh, you know, on European uh, book sales. And second chance how to make and keep big money during the gold and silver shockwave is all about this last leg that we're have just started in where you get the most price appreciation in a really relatively short amount of time. I think the three-year time frame is about right. I think the dollar is pretty much doomed by that time. I, with all due respect to Stanley Druckenmiller, I do think that the end of the dollar as reserve currency is closer to three years than it is 15. 
So that's it. Uh, I don't consult anymore. I took the consultation tab down. Um, I just have so many hours in a day. And although I love people and love helping people and I do like talking to them, it just was more of a distraction and I was just getting overloaded where I just didn't really want to do it um, because it just took me away from my primary function, which is, you know, research into uh, the mining sector and also looking for opportunities in other locations. And of course, always trying to keep cognizant of all that's going on on a global basis so I can report accurately and distill it down for our busy readers in the Morgan Report and give them some food for thought on how to wade through one of the most trying uh, times in all of recorded history with the illness and the mandates, contraction in the food supply, commodity spiking, and a loss of freedom, which is absolutely priceless, basically around the world. So it's a big task. Uh, I'm one of many newsletter writers. I take it probably as seriously as anybody, and my heart's in the right place. I've always wanted to help people. And I think I've got a good perspective. I've signed off every letter, Brian and Daryl, with wishing you health above wealth. Mm. Without health, it really doesn't matter how wealthy you are. Comma, wisdom beyond knowledge, because really wisdom has to do with applied knowledge. Knowledge in and of itself is, you know, not, knowledge is power, knowledge will set you free, but really it's wisdom in the way I see it, because it's applied knowledge. If you know how to eat properly or how many calories you should eat a day, having that knowledge and then not adhering to it for 10 years, really. So what good did the knowledge do you? Not much. So that's it. I'll leave it there. Charlie Tremendous Jones. What a fantastic guy. And really, I think he kept it very right. simple, you know, and I just finished a book. I can't remember the name of it. It's something to do with tomorrow. It's about uh, Canadian wrote it. And uh, went through the whole book. One of a, a pretty well-established gold friend of mine, been in the business 14 years, recommended I read it. I think he wanted me to read it so I could give him some feedback. And it's basically um, technology will save us. Uh, I am pro-technology, but technology will not save us under the current paradigm. There could be a technological breakthrough that I'm unaware of at this point in time that could save us. I doubt it. But in this paradigm we are now, he wrote a chapter on energy, which I'm pretty good at, not an expert. And it was the smallest chapter in the book. It was absolutely, totally, completely off base. Uh, in fact, I made a video. And when I get them all done, Daryl, uh, Brian, I'll let you know. Um, <clears throat> And I'm one of many of this making. It's called Myths in the Silver Market. Myths, M-Y-T-H-S. Myths in the Silver Market. And one of the myths is uh, green energy will save us. And because right. green energy, for the most part, means solar. Yes, it means wind, but it primarily means solar. And the fact is that there is not enough silver on the planet to power the world by solar power. With today's technology, now if there's a technological breakthrough and a solar panel yields... Uh, you know, 50 times the amount of kilowatts that it does now, then, well, maybe we could power half the world or something like that. So there's a lot of myths out there. I probably talked too long. You gave me a short question. I gave you a long answer as usual. But honestly, subscribing to the Morgan Report premium service, I'd love to have a new subscriber, but that's not my primary function. My primary function is education. I do that for free. I'm happy to be associated with As Good As Gold Australia. Uh, look for emails from me. If you are in Australia, our database on Australia is about 2,500 people. And uh, we do uh, send out uh, emails to anyone that we have in our database. And we will often uh, promote as good as Gold Australia to those people. Well, wonderful advice. Uh, and Charlie Tremendous Jones was correct. Wasn't he? Oh, absolutely. It's books you read, the people you meet. Yeah. Mm. Um, and the opportunity to uh, connect um, with David's um, Morgan report and, and generate that sort of information and get that feedback from one of the smartest people in the precious metal space in the world. Mm. 
So, David, it's been a pleasure once again um, with you uh, with the interview this morning and really appreciate the time, the input, your research, uh, which is why we approached you in the first place. We were just very fortunate that we um, developed a good, friendly relationship and um, we've... Uh, we really appreciate everything that you do for As Good As Gold Australia. So um, as well as that, I would suggest right now that we'd like to thank our viewers and our subscribers who continually support this channel. Um, can't appreciate you enough. Thank you so much. Um, and I guess until next time, stay well, stay focused, and goodbye for now. Goodbye for now. Goodbye for now.